So just a quick reminder in case you've forgotten the conjecture. We're looking at the isoperimetric ratio, the Cheeger constant, and the ratio of the boundary to the subset, overall subsets of measure at most a half. And uh, the conjecture is that uh, for any log concave density in any dimension, half spaces minimize this ratio up to a universal constant. Uh, the theorem we currently says that it's uh, at least uh, one over the square root of the trace of the covariance, and uh, the, uh, the, uh, the theorem said, and the conjecture is that it's only the largest eigenvalue that matters. We saw these connections in the last lecture and two algorithms, and so here we are. And what I will lead you through in this lecture is uh, an essentially complete proof of the current best bound, which uh, is in, was uh, improved last year. So uh, the first idea is uh, localization. And the idea is very simple. We want to prove these high dimensional inequalities. That the Cheeger constant is at least something, an integral over the boundary, integral over the set, comparison of integrals of two functions. We'll reduce it to a problem in one dimension. How are we going to do this? So I'll walk you through this technique using one example uh, in target inequality, one of the first and simpler uh, uh, inequalities, which is uh, that uh, 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 isoperimetric ratio uh, is at least 2 over d, but I've kind of restated this instead of using a boundary, keeping everything in the same dimension, the two subsets S1, S2, the complement of those, and we're saying that the volume of the complement is at least the smaller of the two volumes, that's the min, times 2 over d times the distance, the just Euclidean distance between the two. So, of course, as you let the distance go to 0 and divide by, a, by you know, this, this, this will give, recover the Cheeger constant. So, how do we go about proving this? So, what localization says is first let us write it as two inequalities. The first inequality is just saying that the volume of uh, one of those two subsets is smaller, the measure of one of those two subsets is smaller, sure. And then the second one is saying that the measure of this third subset S3 is at least psi times uh, uh, S1. Okay. So, that would of course suffice. Let us rewrite these in terms of just functions in space uh, with indicators in, uh, indicating these subsets, and then we have this, this is what we need to show. Given that the integral of g is non-negative, the integral of h must be uh, less than or equal to 0. Why? Because the first one is saying that S1 is smaller than S2, and the second one is saying that S3 is at least uh, psi times the S1. So, for, purpose of, for the purpose of contradiction, let us assume not that in fact there exists a log concave uh, measure P for which the both, you know, one integral is non-negative and the other one is strictly positive. Suppose this is the case. Still we are in high dimension. And now the idea is two parts. First, in one dimension at least this is false. So the theorem actually holds in one dimension. And then if a, a counterexample exists in some dimension, we will, we will be able to construct a one-dimensional counterexample. That is it. That is the whole game. And so, to do this one-dimensional construction, of this localization lemma of uh, Lovas and Shimnovitz, uh, and it says the following, that if you have two uh, integrable lower semi-continuous functions, they, they do not have to be positive or non-negative, they are just uh, uh, integrable, then, uh, and with positive integrals, then there exists some interval in space. Uh, and a linear function, so that if you take uh, the integral of g weighted by this linear function to the n minus 1, and similarly the integral of h weighted by the same linear function to the n minus 1, these integrals are still positive. So, you can think of the linear function to the n minus 1 as a one dimensional log concave function, it's just a function of t as you go along this interval. So, it is saying that if you had two functions in the original space that were positive, we can produce these, uh, this interval and a log concave function so that reweighted by the log concave function, they remain positive. Um, this was for two inequalities. You can extend it to k inequalities, and there is a different characterization, nice characterization by Fradelisi and Guedon, which uh, um, I, I won't go into here, but it's equivalent for this. 
Um, so using this lemma, what do we, uh, before, first, before using the lemma, let's, let's quickly outline its proof. It's a, it's a, it's a. Um, the functions G and H are not log concave. They are just lower semi-continuous. All, all, all of space, yes. Um, but what we produce at the end of this process is a log concave weighting. So in particular, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I'll, I'll sketch the proof of this the lemma itself. And, and not, but, but yeah, please ask. More. So here's the idea. You've started with these two functions that are both uh, positive integrals. Find a bisecting half space for one function, which means that uh, the integral in the half space is equal to the integral in its complement. So that function will stay positive in both sides. Then, uh, uh, okay. Uh, well, that was one bisection. If you are able to find one bisection, why not find more? So you keep on doing this, keep cutting with these half spaces. And we'll show that the limit of these bisections, well, it's got to be a one, a zero dimensional or one dimensional support. Why? Because if it was two dimensional, we'll still be able to find the bisection. Okay, so that's a limit argument. And then finally, what is the actually going on when you take this limit? The function that's induced around each uh, limiting support is a log concave function. And that, that, that's the log concave function that will appear. Okay, so I'll go over each of these steps in a section, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, over in the next few minutes. The first step is bisection. So we have two functions that are uh, positive, uh, with positive integrals, and I want to sh find a half space that is, um, uh, that contains, you know, that, that, that bisects one of the integrals, right? Uh, how are we going to do this? Well, in fact, they're everywhere. Why? Because you can do the following. You have uh, some function in space, and uh, let's say I think of it like this, and uh, I, I consider just uh, hi hyperplanes with normal vectors in a particular two-dimensional subspace. Okay? Um, so uh, that two-dimensional subspace circle like this, and for any um, uh, uh, normal vector u, I can define the function, which is the integral in this half space minus its complement. Okay. Um, uh, okay. <laughs> so, so, so if this half space is h, I look at the integral of g over h minus the integral of g over the complement of h. Oh, this is either, if it's zero, we're done. If it's positive, well, look at the opposite half space. It must be negative. So just using this, the, the continuity of G, there will be a point where, where, uh, where it bisects. The most elementary intermediate value argument. But you need two dimensions for it. And now you can say, take all rational points in your support and uh, apply bisections at every rational point. So as long as you have a two-dimensional support, you'll be able to make progress, so the limit must be must be one dimensional or zero dimensional. Now, when we're doing this, so that's the sequence that you would get. Now, at every point, if you look at, now let's observe what's happening to one of these uh, limiting objects. So we've got this uh, process going on. I'm cutting here, I'm cutting, I'm cutting. I'm just observing one of, uh, with, with, with foresight, I know what the limit is going to be. Maybe it's this interval. And so I, I observe what's happening to it. Well, what's happening to it? You never cut that interval, that's the final support. But at every point, you're maintaining a convex body because it's an intersection of half spaces. So that means the profile uh, the, the, that, that it's converging to is, remains log concave. Okay? Uh, it's, it's a one-dimensional thing, so the weighting has to be log concave. And uh, in the limit also, it's the case. In fact, uh, you, you, uh, yeah, so this, this radius function is going to be concave. That's just Brun-Minkowski. And now, re the, the, the lemma says not only concave, it's actually a linear function to the n minus 1. It's a 1 over n a concave function. Uh, that takes some more work. I won't, I won't do that here. Okay, so, so going back to the, how we're going to apply it, we want to show that if S1 is less than S2, then S3 is at least some fraction of S1. And so we set up these two functions, and we need to show this. And we said, suppose not for a contradiction, then we apply localization, the lemma we just uh, sketched the proof of, and we get these two, this, this conclusion that there exists this linear function, 
Now let's look at what this linear function is doing. Uh, we can think of the, uh, this uh, linear, this interval as being partitioned by the original subsets. So we have this interval, and I'll, I'll now reparameterize it to 0, 1. The original subsets S1, S2, S3 will, uh, you know, maybe this, and I'll call this Z1, maybe it's this subset, and then Z2 is somewhere, and Z3 is somewhere. It's a partition of this interval. So we're asking exactly uh, the question about isoperimetry of this, in one dimension, of these subsets, which are, of course, now just a union of intervals. But uh, the function is the original function weighted by this linear function. That's it. But if you translate it back, it's, uh, it's saying if you take your original, so we want to apply this to, to the volume function there. If you take your original log concave function multiplied by a linear function, still log concave, product is log concave, and both are log concave, then is it true that if you have a partition into three, where you know that one is smaller than the other, then the complement of, of both is large. Right? So it's exactly the original question in one dimension for log concave functions. Now in one dimension, for any log concave function, this is all we need to prove. This will, this will now imply the entire thing. And that, you see, without the factor of two, is just completely trivial. All you need to use is unimodality. Uh, on one side of whatever interval you are in, it must be decreasing. Therefore, the entire integral is at least the ratio of the supports times the, uh, at least the ratio of supports, and that's one over d. If you wanted to get the factor of two in there, we really have to use log concavity and show that the worst case is the exponential function. Uh, so that's, that's, that's how it works for proving this high dimensional reduced one dimension and then show that in one dimension it's true. Okay, now this technique, just as described already, uh, has many applications, many other isoperimetric inequalities, uh, surprising ones. The, the, the fact I mentioned in the first lecture that uh, the KLS conjecture holds for Gaussians modified by log concave functions, you can do that by just this technique, because as you keep cutting, the limit will still have to carry the Gaussian with you. Um, and this is the statement that if you have a density that's any log concave function times the Gaussian with weight t there, then, uh, then the Cheever constant is at least square root t. The analysis of this last volume algorithm I mentioned, not the sampling part, but the actual analysis of the algorithm itself, how many phases you need, uses localization. Um, Anti-concentration of polynomials over log concave densities can be shown using uh, localization. And there are other applications. Now, however, the technique does not work for us to improve the KLS bound. And the reason is the following. Um, you might start with some nice body, okay, and it's isotropic. So the expectation of uh, xx transpose is identity, and the mean, let's say, is zero. And now um, you apply localization. You start dividing this up. You reach, and so you say, if there is a counterexample, there's going to be a counterexample in one dimension. But you see, the problem is this. Even though the original body in any direction has expectation of uh, x transpose v squared equal to 1, which is nice, so the variance is 1, and you get nice isoperimetry potentially in one direction, certainly for the marginal. After you break it up into these needles, you could end up with a long, thin needle. And that has strictly worse isoperimetry because the induced function there depends on its largest eigenvalue, which now is much larger. Even though the largest eigenvalue when you started with was 1, as you keep cutting, the needles could have eigenvalue as large as essentially the diameter of the original body. That is the catch with this, with this approach to try to prove better isoperimetry. You're stuck with the function and the dimension. So here is a way, potential way around that, stochastic localization. So again, our goal is the same. We want to lower bound the expansion. So the idea is this. We'll, we will apply these bisections again, these hyperplane cuts. But let's do them randomly. Uh, not in any worst case sense. We'll actually apply them randomly. Now, you see, if I'm going to apply these cuts randomly, the chance that I will get some long, thin thing should be low. And maybe I get a few long, thin ones, but all I want is global isoperimetry. So from those long, thin ones, I might not get any, um, 
mm, any useful uh, lower uh, addition to the overall boundary measure. But from all the ones that are short, I will get something nice and useful. So if I can show that most of these are short by random bisections, then, 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 you're, then you're happy. So nice as it is, but I tried this for many years, and <laughs> I still think it should work, but I don't know how to make it work. Uh, okay, but you know, there are other things I think should happen, but uh, okay. But meanwhile, um, Ronan Eldan uh, uh, came up with the following uh, concrete realization of this, uh, 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 could view it as a realization of this, of this approach. And he said, uh, rather than trying to do these discrete half space cuts, hyperplane cuts, let's apply an infinitesimal linear reweighting in a random direction. So you pick a random direction, and in that direction, we're basically going to multiply by a tiny exponential function. Okay? Uh, we, well, I'm going to describe this completely precisely in a minute. Uh, and we do this uh, repeatedly. And he used this idea to prove that the thin shell conjecture, if you remember, that most of the volume of an isotropic log concave density lies in a shell of constant thickness, implies the KLS conjecture up to a log n factor in a universal sense. If you had a universal bound on the thin shell constant, then you get a bound on the KLS constant up to log n. So you use this in a, in a very interesting proof. And so here is the method. But I, what I'm going to describe is a simplified version that will give us directly the KLS bound. So we start with some density. It's the starting density P of x, whatever is the density for which you want to prove the Cheeger constant. At time t, we'll have a density Pt. So this density is going to change over time not by discrete cuts, but by something else. Uh, and it, of course, the density has some mean. Now, infinitesimal change is the following, and this is the only equation you need to worry about, in the, uh, and then this, this captures all the information of the proof, that the infinitesimal change in the density is going to be the original density times, you see, the, 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 the distance of the point from the mean, so it depends how far you are from the mean, so at the mean there is no change times dWt, which is an infinitesimal Gaussian, you know, a, a, a Wiener process, but the infinitesimal version. Um, so that's picking the random direction and the, and, and the tiny magnitude, infinitesimal magnitude. So if you would like to think of it discreetly, which is how I originally convinced myself it's actually true, uh, there you say that the density is getting multiplied by this factor, 1 plus square root h, think of h as very small, times this uh, inner product of your distance along a random, random Gaussian direction. So you pick the random WT, you look at the, 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 your projection to that, how far you are from the, from the mean in that direction, times square root h, tiny number, uh, is that. That's the discrete version. So the, yeah, WT is just a standard Gaussian. So that's the, pro pro the procedure. Now using this process, we're, we can prove the following things. I already mentioned that. Uh, that this is what Eldan proved, that the KLS constant is at least log n over the, the, the universal thin shell bound. Uh, with, uh, with the entire Lee, we proved that the, the, the Cheeger constant is actually at least 1 over trace of a squared to the 1 fourth. If you remember, the KLS theorem says it's square root of the trace of a. Uh, I'll put it up in a second for comparison. And in particular, for log concave densities, this Im immediately implies n to the minus one fourth because a is identity. So you get n to the one over n to the one fourth instead of one over root n. It also shows, and this is uh, uh, very recent, that the log Sobolov constant of isotropic log concave densities with support of diameter d is one over d, and that's the best possible bound. Uh, log Sobolov is a stronger condition. We'll, we'll get there. And it cannot be a constant in general. That was already known. But the, this is the tight bound, uh, best possible. So again, this is the KLS theorem, that, uh, that the, the Cheeger constant is at least the trace to the power of 1 half, the sum of the eigenvalues. This is the new theorem, that it's the, instead of the 1 norm, it's the 2 norm of the eigenvalues, square root. This is the conjecture. It's just the infinity norm. So of course, uh, you know what the next step in this program should be, but, uh, but I don't know how to prove it. Yeah. Not yet. <laughs> uh, okay. So here's the proof strategy. So, so, so uh, I'll show you the proof. 
Uh, first, this change in density maintains a martingale. It is a martingale. It maintains the density. That is completely clear because we are multiplying by a, by a, by a Gaussian and, and, and x minus mu. So, the effect. Second, that it will in fact suffice to prove the theorem not for the original density, but for the density after some time t. Okay. That is going to, we have to show that. Now, how long? That is the game. If you can, if you can show this for a later and later time, it will be easier and easier. Okay, that that's part of it. But at some time t, we'll show that. Look, if it suffices to prove it for that, for the density at that time t. And finally, the density at time t, we're going to be able to show easily has a good Schiller constant. Why? Because the density is somehow getting simpler and simpler. If if, if we followed that methodology and we're really getting one-dimensional, oh, it's very simple. It won't be quite that easy, but it will get simpler and simpler. Okay, so uh, so you could ask fundamentally. One question is, why does the density become easier to handle or have a good Schiller constant as you apply this reweighting? Somehow that is the most important question. Why is this density getting? And I am um, going to try to show you <laughs> uh, on a picture first uh, why that might be the, the case. Um, uh, Let us see. So, if you did just localization, you have some, what would you do? You are cutting. So, you know, you cut and cut. And if I look at a random piece, you know, of the final thing, okay, maybe, maybe I am going, going there. Um, I was looking for color. Okay. Um, and so, Okay, so it's tending to something like this. Now, what's happening with stochastic localization? Okay, you're, you have the same thing. Now, you pick a random direction and you apply a slight reweighting. And in another random direction, you apply a slight reweighting. You see the difference? No, this is complete nonsense. But uh, 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 here is a, a picture. Now, this might not convince you either. So, what I did is. I made a movie. <laughs> you can see what's happening with stochastic localization in this triangle. And if you have any predictions about what's going to happen, you're welcome to tell me. As time progresses, this movie is only one minute long. It won't take up the rest of the lecture. But uh, but uh, this is literally stochastic localization being applied to just the two-dimensional set in this case. Uh, do you see what's happening? Yeah, yeah. There's a there's a Gaussian trying to break out, yeah, yeah. Um, I I let, I let it run so that you have no doubts left. But, <laughs> but no, no. We'll, we'll after that we'll do the formal proof. I wasn't clear on what was happening with the mean. Mu t. Yeah. So the reweighting has to be centered at the mean at every time. So the the yeah, recenter. Yeah. So that's all. That's right. So the, the process includes the mean in its definition of the next step. Yeah. Um, okay. So yeah, As David uh, guessed uh, uh, or knew there's going to be a Gaussian emerging. So you see, once there's a Gaussian emerging, things should get easier. So you see. So so let's see. We have this is the definition of the process, right? Uh, you say recenter at the mean and you apply this random Gaussian. How do we understand what's happening? Let me look at the log of this function. Now, normally, if I wanted to take the derivative of the log, I just apply the chain rule, <laughs> right? And one of the nice things that I can do almost without error. But uh, uh, here there's a bit tricky situation because of this DWT. You know, what does it mean to do chain rule when you have this Gaussian being added? And this is a whole subject, stochastic calculus. This is the for exercise one in that course. And we have uh, Ito's lemma, which says that if you have a, a, a stochastic process given to you, the simplest version, there's a deterministic mu t dt, and then there's a stochastic sigma t dwt. In our case, the mu t is, has been uh, effectively taken out, zero. Then the, the derivative of any function of the stochastic uh, process is, uh, is going to be almost like a chain rule. You see, if you had the standard chain rule, you would have only the first term, right? Um, but now you also have the second term. Why does the second term show up? 
It's because you see the Gaussian over time t only looks like square root t. You have a question. Uh, no, no, it's, it's infinitesimal. So if, as if it's positive, uh, there's no, uh, yeah, and if it gets closer, then it's a smaller change. So yeah, because there's a multiplying factor, pt, there. So it never actually goes below zero. It stays the density. Yeah, we'll see now. So, uh, um, but you see this emergence of the second term. If you've never seen stochastic calculus before, like I hadn't uh, 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 nine months ago or 10 months ago, then uh, so why is that happening? Well, it's because dWt is of a different magnitude than dt. After time t, Gaussian at time t looks only like square root t. So you have to worry about the second term in the Taylor expansion. And so if you just take Taylor expand ffxt, you have to look at the second term. Everything else is lower order. But the second term still shows up as dt. And uh, then when you apply that to, to log, now you, can, now you have a chain rule. You just apply that, and we get this expression here. Log is 1 over pt, and then second derivative is minus 1. And, uh, and, and we see that it actually looks like this uh, original part plus quadratic. And if I replace it even more explicitly, there is the x transpose times some, some, some infinitesimal function, x squared minus half x squared, and gt. And, and this last term, gt, is just I collected everything that does, doesn't depend on x, depends only on t. And therefore, the, di the density at time t looks like the original density p, that was, that was the log, times x transpose ct, whatever is the evolution of the first term there, minus t over 2 times x squared. So at time t, you're picking up a Gaussian term with coefficient t. Um, and for such distributions, we already saw from the first lecture, uh, and we can prove this by standard localization, and it's uh, been proven multiple times, that in fact the Chigurh constant is square root t. So if you're able to go for a constant time, you get, con you get the Chigurh constant as a constant. Now, uh, the proof of this is just applied standard localization lemma. What your, the, your one-dimensional needles, one-dimensional supports, will still carry the Gaussian with them, and then the, you have a one-dimensional inequality, which is like a, just says that the variance of a Gaussian restricted to a convex body can only be smaller than that of the original Gaussian. It's a brass camp lean inequality. Okay, so that's, that's, the destination is good, the target is good, but uh, we, have to, we have to worry about how long we can go. Why? Because we still need to imply, infer, that the original distribution has good Chigurh constant, not the target. Of course we know, the, uh, you know, uh, target great, but what about the original? So uh, let's, let's ATP the covariance at time t, and you look at any measurable subset, and we want to see what's happening to the subset, right? Well, the, the, the change in the subset is, uh, is still a martingale because uh, it's just an integral of the change at every point. So it's, it's, it's still a martingale, any subset, or its boundary, overall thing. So the expectations are correct. If I look at the measure of any one subset, the expectations are just right. But of course, I want the ratio of two, so I have to worry about that. I got to keep one under control, and then I can use the expectation on the other. Yeah, I'm just using first and second moments. So, so you look at the variance of this, how much this changes. And the variance is, is this, uh, this length square term, which we bound by just saying it's the maximum over uh, inner products with any unit length vector. And uh, separating, and then I'm saying the first moment square is at most the, the, the second moment. And that's exactly the, the largest eigenvalue of the current covariance matrix. So the variance at time t of this stochastic process is exactly the largest eigenvalue of the current covariance matrix, or bounded by the largest eigenvalue of the current covariance. It is that up to a constant. Okay. So as long as we can keep the largest eigenvalue small, of the, we started with identity, as long as we can keep the largest eigenvalue small, we can continue this process. Now, uh, uh, what, what I'm going to say now is that, um, so, so how do, we, how do we complete this? First, to bound the Chigurh constant, it's enough to consider subsets of measure exactly one half. You don't need to consider every subset. Turns out that the minimum is going to be achieved by subsets of measure one half. It's a symmetric function and unimodal. Second, 
Suppose we can keep the operator norm small for some time t. We can keep the integral of the operator norm, the largest eigenvalue less than 0 0.01. Now we know that the expectation of the density at any time is the original. So if I, I want to bound this Cheeger constant for some subset of measure less than one half, the subset is oh, equal to one half, so that's twice the expectation of whatever it is at time t. But now what is the measure of the boundary at time t? It's the Cheeger constant of the distribution at time t times the smaller of the measures of subset and its complement. It's no longer the case that it's at measure one half. It might have changed its measure. So that's the, the, the goal now, to make sure that it doesn't change by too much. If it changes by a constant, if it becomes one fourth, no big deal, we will lose a factor of two. So, so as long as we can keep the measure within constants, we're good. And uh, so, so the critical point is, what is the probability that it stays bounded? That is governed exactly by the variance, which we said, let's say for now, is bounded by 0 0.01. So the entire game, is to keep the spectral norm of the covariance matrix small for as long as you can. Uh, uh, and, but, but this sounds like exactly what we wanted. After all, all we wanted to do was bound the covariance matrix of, of, the, of the, uh, uh, the largest eigenvalue. Not quite. This process will give us some control. So instead of the largest eigenvalue, which is a highly uh, sensitive thing, let's look at the trace of the covariance square. right? So the square root of that will be an upper bound. I mean, and all I'm saying is that the square root of the sum of squares of eigenvalues is an upper bound on the largest eigenvalue. OK, so we will make sure that to stop by the time this doubles. OK, so it doesn't go by too much. And in particular, uh, uh, we will be able to go up as far as 1 over the square root of the original uh, value of this trace of uh, the covariance squared. And therefore, we'll be able to show that the operator norm is bounded up to that time. And since the original value of trace of at squared is a trace of eight squared, we're able to go up to time, which is one over square root of that, and then the corresponding Cheeger constant, because we re have this Gaussian with a t factor now, is square root of the t, you get this n to the minus one fourth. That, that's how. So it remains to show that this potential function stays bounded. Or up to this time. So how do we do it? We have this function here, trace of at squared. I want to see how it changes. So now we have this new tool, right? It's chain rule again. Let's see how it changes. Uh, so you can write down the formula for that. Um, uh, and uh, you know you have these terms here, which I'll absorb into a deterministic term and a, and a stochastic term. And we need to bound these values. And so for this, we use an elementary lemma about log concave functions. First, this whole uh, uh, Borel inequality or reverse holder, that moments are uh, not much higher than the second moment to the appropriate power, to the, to the power, times a function of k. That if you look at the two independent random draws x and y from the same distribution, their inner product, the third moment is at most the trace of a squared to the three halves. And then uh, uh, this uh, vector, the length of this vector, which is the x, x, the, the, the x minus mu, x minus mu transpose, A being the, uh, a, a, any matrix A, uh, uh, semi-definite, times x minus mu, it's at most operator norm trace phase squared. Each of these inequalities is a, is a, is a, is a straightforward exercise using properties of log concavity. Now, from these though, from these bounds, we can, we can bound those, those two coefficients in front of the, the deterministic term and the stochastic term. The delta t, the magnitude, is trace of a squared to the 3 halves, which is the original potential to the 3 halves. The length of the coefficient of the stochastic term is trace of a squared times the square root of the operator norm. Trace of a squared is 1 phi. The square root of operator norm is square root of uh, the square root of phi. That's a phi to the 1 fourth. So you get this phi to the 5 fourth. So therefore, the stochastic equation essentially looks like this. The change in the potential is at most phi t to the 3 halves times dt and phi t to the 5 fourth times dwt. Okay. So again, a is the covariance matrix of the log concave then, by definition, or do you say that we're doing an arbitrary? In that statement there, uh, the, 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 yes, there I'm assuming a is the covariance matrix, yes. 
Yes, there is a more general version we can write there with a C, but uh, the right-hand side has to be modified, where uh, basically I'm going to replace the trace of A square with trace of A to the half C, trace of A to the half. But, but yeah, this, this as stated, it's, it's the covariance matrix. Um, okay, so now uh, here we are. This is what we got from the from from looking at the change in the phi, and uh, the solution to this you can guess. I mean, know the first term goes by t, and the second one goes goes by square root t, and both of them are under control for time up to one over square root of the original potential. At that point, it starts blowing up. Uh, so up to that time, one over square root of the original potential, your uh, uh, your uh, integral of the operator norm stays constant, and the measure of the subset therefore stays balanced. The variance is small, and uh, and uh, and we get this bound on the expansion of trace space square to the minus one fourth, which is n to the minus one. That's the proof. The only parts you haven't seen are the proof of the log concavity, which we can work out on the board. Okay, so um, using these uh, ideas, we can uh, prove a few other things, which I'll, uh, I'll, I'll outline now. One of them is, uh, is the log Sobolev constant. Uh, this is the largest, oh, sorry, I changed the notation to, to LS, log Sobolev for density P. It's the largest uh, number you can put so that uh, you see on the right-hand side, it looks like the Chigar, I mean the Poincare constant, except there's a log f squared there, uh, and so and, and we're taking this uh, over all smooth functions with expectation of f squared one. This is stronger than the Chigar or Poincare uh, statement. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Rho is the same as LS. LS. Sorry. Yeah. I, I changed from Rho thinking LS was easier to read as a log so below. Um, and so you could ask, can this be constant for isotropic P? And the answer is no. Uh, in fact, uh, it can be as small as one over the diameter in general, if the support has diameter D. So this is true even for an exponential function. And the theorem we'll be able to show is that in fact it is one over D. That, that one over D is a tight bound for an isotropic log concave density with uh, support of diameter uh, D. Previously, Kanan, Lovas, and uh, Montenegro had shown uh, a bound of 1 over D squared. And you'll see why they were motivated to this. Very closely related to this is the log Chigar constant. And this definition, again, is very intuitive. So the log of the Chigar constant, or log Chigar constant. If you see, if I ignored the square root log term, that is the Chigar constant. The ratio of the boundary to the ratio of the set. But we're additionally normalizing by square root of the log of the inverse of the measure of this set. So, so it's a stronger constant. You, for smaller sets, you are, you are asking for more. Okay. When you have a very small set, you want more expansion. That's what I'm saying. Smaller sets expand faster. Um, this can be arbitrarily small, for example, even for an exponential distribution. But it, 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 whatever it is, it implies it has stronger con consequences. It implies, for example, a Gaussian tail. And you can think of the overall setup like this. Just the way that Chigar relates to spectral gap, the log Chigar relates to log sub log. They are squares. So the, the log uh, Chigar uh, constant squared is the log sub log constant uh, for log concave functions up to a universal constant. Now, I'll, I'll motivate this some more. Um, uh, but first, just a sketch of the bounds. Uh, for a Gaussian measure, even the log Chigar is a constant. That's the point. So for when you have a Gaussian, even with this scale drawn in, so for a Gaussian, the, prob the, the, the measure of a subset um, is at least uh, not just uh, constant times, uh, let's say the subset has measured less than one half, not just constant times the measure of the set, but you also get to put in here square root log one over the measure of the set. Assume that it's less than one half. You have this additional term, which we didn't even use in the first part, but it's actually there for small subsets. 
So, so for, for Gaussians, it's constant. Uh, and if you have a Gaussian term, it's still square root t. <laughs> okay, so, so we get to say that uh, as long as you're approaching Gaussian, it's large. It's 1 over d uh, for log concave p with diameter d. That's the result of Kanan, Lovas, and Montenegro. It's uh, 1 over d for, uh, in fact, for any non-negative curvature manifold of diameter d. And all of these results are tight uh, 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 um, uh, as this, as stated. But uh, for isotropic log concave p, it's actually 1 over square root d. And this is also tight. So one consequence of this is the following improved large deviation inequality. Uh, uh, a theorem of Powers says that if I look at the, the probability of deviation from, uh, from, a, from the mean of an isotropic log concave density, then you see uh, outside a ball, you, you expect to be at root n. But after that, it decays exponentially fast. That's what it's saying there. Now, outside root n, it, it, so this large deviation inequality is, is, is very sharp. In particular, if you put t equals, say, some constant times root n, it's, it's dropping exponentially fast, and that's the best possible. Uh, at the lower end, there was a result by Gordon and Millman that says it's t cube over n. And uh, what we can get using the new bound is that, uh, in fact, it's t squared over root n, which one reason that's nice is that besides a common generalization of all the above, it extends to any Lipschitz function first. And second, it also recovers gromov milman in this range because uh, t squared over root n in place of t times the KLS constant, which happens to be n to the one fourth now. So this is a common generalization of all the large deviation inequalities and applies to Lipschitz functions. Okay, so uh, here's the other motivation for log sub law of constant in general, but also these bounds. We, this is just, the first relation is just a spectral gap with sugar constant. The dependence on the initial density, the initial distribution is log of the smallest stational probability. That's why we say let's start warm so that that log is a constant. But uh, another theorem of Lovas and Cannon says that you could inst instead consider a notion of average conductance, where you look at the average over all mm, subset measures. Instead of just taking the worst as in conductance, you look at for every x, what is the corresponding worst Cheeger constant for subsets of that measure and average that. And that, if it's at least square root log 1 over x times some, some, some ratio, then the dependence on the start parameter becomes log log. And this is a general phenomenon with log so below. That's why it gives you a sharper mixing time bound in terms of where you started. And they asked the question already in, uh, by Friesen 97, what is this constant for isotropic log concave densities? So just a word about this proof. We use the exact same process, but we need a much finer control on lambda 1. And for this, we use what one might think of as a Stilges or BSS potential. BSS stands for Batson, Spielman, Srivastava. And this potential is slightly different. Previously, we just used the trace of A squared. Now what I'm doing is we're defining this function U as the function which satisfies this equation. It certainly dominates the eigenvalues, but the trace of Ui minus AT to some power is, is a fixed, fixed value. In other words, if you think of this U as your barrier, it's higher than all the eigenvalues. You're looking at the sum of the reciprocals square in our case, but could be a different power, and that's fixed. So when some eigenvalue starts approaching, this U just blows up. And this is what we're gonna, we, we use to control uh, uh, the growth of the process. So here we are. We, uh, I want to spend a few minutes now on open problems and extensions to manifolds. Um, um, uh, uh, okay. Uh, the first one is uh, this notion that we talked about random needle decompositions uh, in, by different methods. But in fact, may, as far as I know, arbitrary needle decompositions, take a body, divide it, bisect it any way you want till you reach needles. Is it true that a positive fraction of the needles are all short? In other words, all have small eigenvalues. I don't have a counterexample to this. Take a log concave density, divide it up any way you want. And I want to say 
that for a positive fraction of the needles, they are in fact have small uh, variance. Then you can immediately conclude the KLS, KLS conjecture is true. Okay. Um, other problems? For an explicit polytope, can you estimate the volume with no randomness? Up to a factor of two. I have no idea. Lower bound for sampling? We, if the KLS conjecture is true, the complexity of sampling is n squared from a warm start. Is this the best possible for any algorithm that requires an information theoretic uh, lower bound? These are more uh, algorithmic questions about how we might estimate the isotropic transformation more quickly and uh, uh, a, a, a different process that seems to be the fastest in practice, whether we can prove that it's also fast theoretically. And this one, insta, you know, in this hit and run process where we picked a random direction uh, completely from the sphere, it seems enough to just pick it as one of the axes. And that leads to a different geometric question for its proof, which we don't know the answer to. And finally, uh, to get to manifolds, how would uh, nature <laughs> choose sample? And it seems like Brownian motion is the right answer, which is the continuous version of this ball walk. Just take your delta down to zero, uh, or corresponds to your heat equation. But then, the, what do you do at the boundary? <laughs> I mean, that is, of course, the critical question. What do you do at the boundary? One thing you could do is reflect. That has many nice things. But you have very uh, similar issues. You see, you have to use extremely small step sizes to make sure you get it right to do the reflection. Otherwise, you might not. You might be stepping out all the time. Another thing you could do is just remove the boundary. What do I mean by this? I mean the following, that in place of the original say polytope in this case, let's stick to a polytope, we will replace that with this manifold which blows up at the boundary, but goes on forever. So which inherently keeps you away from the boundary effectively, slows you down as you go to the boundary. So here is a more formal description. We'll only use Hessian manifolds. So the, the inner product at any point is defined by the Hessian of a fixed convex function. And what is the convex function? It's what's called the log barrier. So it if I have this polytope for a point, uh, that, that star point there, it looks at the distances to the different, in, different boundaries, takes the log of the reciprocal, and adds them up. So of course, it blows up whenever the distance goes to 0. So uh, uh, it blows up, like we we're saying. And we're going to walk with respect to this metric, not the Euclidean straight line metric, but with respect to this. So this will get slower when it gets to the, to the boundary. Uh, and the other question is, why will it reach uniform? So to make sure it reaches uniform, we add a drift in a deterministic term. So we can't just do dxt is dwt, the pure Brownian motion, but at every step there's a field that's, uh, that's pushing you in such a way that you get the uniform distribution. You're not spending too much time close to the boundary. So here's what it looks like. The process is called Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. You run Brownian motion with drift, and this drift is exactly uh, the the the... the the gradient of the log of uh, the, the, the uh, uh, covariance at the, at the current point. And uh, how do we discretize this? So you look at the current point, look at its tangent bundle, pick a, pick a, pick a uh, you know, it's, it's, it's plain, pick a random Gaussian in there, and uh, solve for its drift, what the drift should be, repeat. That's the process. So there's this, this field out there. You're trying to move along that manifold, but you do it with drift. This is symmetric. It, in fact, preserves volume. There's no need for a rejection step. You don't waste time trying to worry about are you in or out, or do you have the right probabilities? It's symmetric already. And you can think of it as a generalization of hit and run to manifolds. This converges faster than anything we know, probably. m times n to the 2 thirds goes below the quadratic barrier. For a hypercube, it makes us in constant time. Uh, all previous methods need at least n steps. Of course, we know how to sample a hypercube in other ways, but, but showing something. Now, one question is, what's the right metric to use that's still computable? What's the best metric? These are, this is a sort of a, a simple one that we could analyze. Another question is, what's the corresponding KLS conjecture in this setting? When you have these manifolds, maybe let's say Hessian manifolds. So, we do have a start into that, and I will stop. Then. Um, uh, namely, that if you look at, the, look at a, a Hessian manifold, but I want an additional property that's not only it's convex, but it's twice convex. The Hessian is also convex. 
then in that case, in fact, we get uh, something as strong as Gaussian isoperimetry. The, 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 this this, this uh, exponential function integral is at least the distance given by the, uh, uh, the Riemannian metric. And uh, in particular, if I take the function phi to be just length of x squared and the Euclidean metric, then this corresponds exactly to the Gaussian uh, times log concave isoperimetric inequality. What are further generalizations? What's the right uh, general statement? I don't know. Here is a, a, an optimistic version which says that in fact half spaces are still the best if I define the isoperimetric ratio in terms of distance to a subset. But it's not, I, won't, I don't want to conjecture it. But I don't know how to think about a counterexample either. Um, yeah. And uh, I would like to thank uh, many people, but including uh, Ravi Latsi, Miki, Adam, and and Ben Cousins. Thank you. Question. I have a question. So, the first one is what does the convex Hessian mean? Is the convex function what's that? Uh, so, you look at the Hessian and you look at its uh, directional derivative. Second derivative. Second derivative, yeah, and that's still positive, it's still non-negative. So, so it's, a, it's a matrix. Uh, yeah, but you can think of it as a, a as a function once I look at uh, fixed two directions. So, so then the other thing is, what was what was g? What was the, the metric you were creating? Oh, g g uh, g was coming from the logarithmic barrier, uh, in that case. So the provable case is. Um, uh, uh, that g there is uh, the covariance of this uh, log barrier function. So take the Hessian of this function phi of x. And the s the Just the distance to the boundary, oh, ai transpose so x. Yeah. The distance is to the yeah. So the Hessian has an explicit form. It just looks like a. So, so g is the, the Hessian. Right. And, and, it, and it looks um, just like ax, ax transpose. Yeah. Uh, and it satisfies the twice convex property. So <laughs> that was uh, the motivation for s stating that version, yeah. Any, any other questions? Okay, thanks. Thank you.